trail sites up on that hill. They are in our land. We asked them to back off the other day. They come back. They are not to be on that land. Our ancestors are on that land. Our people have come together. We're here for prayer. We're here to stop this with prayer. But they are pushing. to 14 graves up there, what you would call graves. We asked them the other day when they were up there, they were kicking rocks around and knocking sticks down. How would you like it in Arlington Temple Cemetery if all our Kichita went over and stood on them, or all our people started doing that? We will not do that, we are not asking for that. But we do need them to respect us also. Sisters, they they went through a terrible time in their lifetime and right now they can't even rest at peace their remains can't rest at peace because of the destruction of the pipeline when I see the military police force I honestly with no doubt hope everything's aimed it at me because our elders and our kids are suffering a lot they are and I feel like I can handle that pressure and I feel that I can live through it. I went over there okay, trying to pray, pocket. trying to tell them to return on this side and pray as a unit. Because they're over there, they're not doing anything but antagonizing them. There's a couple people over there in prayer, but that whole line right there, they, they're forgetting why we're here. They're forgetting the prayer. So we need to continue to remind them why we're here. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything, you know, like some protesters do get out of hand as well as, you know, some officers, but that that's only because the officers escalate it before and we try everything to defend our people. But that's why the Youth Council really speaks out about staying there in prayer and to stay peaceful. For this movement to keep going, you gotta stay positive and stay peaceful and stay in prayer because this is a ceremony and we have to protect what we have here and that's our prayer. And that's just one thing that can't stop. For months, the Standing Rock Sioux and their allies have camped out on the banks of the Cannonball River in North Dakota. Their mission? To stop the Dakota Access Pipeline, a $3.7 billion project slated to deliver crude oil from North Dakota to Southern Illinois. The proposed route comes within 1,500 feet of the current Standing Rock Reservation, and the tribe fears the pipeline will contaminate its drinking water and destroy its sacred sites. It's a cause that's drawn the support of thousands from across the globe. But at the heart of it all, there's a little known group of indigenous youth who has helped steer the movement from the very beginning. They are known as the International Indigenous Youth Council, or IIYC. See, I have never heard that. I've never heard that you can only do that in the 
people think kids these days are dumb. Like, I don't know. I don't think anybody takes us seriously, really. The whole millennial deal, I don't know. But, like, we're really smart. I believe that the youth started this movement, so we will be the ones to make that last stand to finish this movement. Because none of us are here to lose and go back home, you know? The youth are gonna kill this black snake and everybody's gonna help us. And it's gonna be nice. And we're gonna celebrate. The youth started this movement with Jason Charger and the No Dapple Runners running to D.C. and Omaha, and they ran a long way. That's a long way from Cannonball, North Dakota to Washington, D.C., but they did it. We run! We run. For, our brothers. for our brothers and our sisters! For our sister. we, run. we run! For our people! The run was pretty cool. It, uh, it kind of brought me back to my spiritual being. I never thought there would be as many people as there was on the run because we were just bringing awareness. Um, I didn't expect people to come up and fight beside us with this pipeline. I didn't know that was going to lead to a specific spot where we were going to have this one massive ceremony and that involved prayer. And it's really amazing how that happened. The Youth Council, we started it here at Standing Rock. Five people like came to the first meeting. It was me, my brother Alex, and our friend Jacelyn Charger. Terrell at our very first council meeting. Now we are our core of like 20, you know, kind of with people ranging to coming to our meetings between 30 and 50 people. It's powerful to see how, you know, just a small group of people, you know, there was only, you know, there was less than 10 of us when we started. And now we have this, this whole movement you know, we, we laugh together, we cry together. You know, we're, we're one big family. And it's awesome, you know, because a lot of us here in the Youth Council, you know, maybe never would had, you know, a family like this before. You know, never had people care about them, you know, the way we care about them. And it's, it's healing. It's historically proven that indigenous kids were ripped from their families and cleansed of all, everything that we had. We, we cut, I cut our hair. They beat us when we spoke our language. We weren't allowed to pray. We weren't allowed to wear our clothes. We were not allowed to be who we are. And so we're finally coming back and we're healing with one another and allowing ourselves to become the leaders that we know we are. There's a lot in my life that I learned from. I grew up around you know, American Indian movement leaders. I come from a long line of land protectors and water protectors. My ancestor, you know, Iron Shell, he was the, the chief of the whole you know, Teton Bruli tribe. We've been silent for so long with the historical trauma that we face. Our identities were taken from us. Our voices were taken from us. And now we have them back and we aren't going to stand for broken treaties and political prisoners anymore. You know, this is, you know, we're the seventh generation. Simply put, to even begin to understand what's happening at Standing Rock, you have to go back centuries. The ancestors of the Standing Rock Sioux originally inhabited the Great Lakes region. But by the 17th century, an influx of white fur traders and competition among other tribes for dwindling resources pushed them west onto the Great Plains. But the 1848 discovery of gold in California unleashed a wave of white fortune seekers who crossed through Sioux territory en route, setting off a series of confrontations that resulted in the signing of the historic Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. In exchange for ceding all of their territory east of the Missouri River, the Sioux were promised lands extending from outside modern-day Bismarck, North Dakota, all the way to southern Nebraska, an area that now includes the current Dakota Access Pipeline route. In our 1851 treaty, we entered into a peace contract with the federal government. Before the ink was dry, Westerners start coming through. 
The federal government did little to stop white settlers from encroaching further into Sioux lands. And a subsequent treaty in 1868, followed by several congressional acts, resulted in the Sioux losing most of the land originally set aside for them. There's not one senator, not one governor, that can say our lands were not illegally taken from us. By the close of the 19th century, the Sioux had endured abusive assimilation schools, the outlawing of their religion, dependence on government aid, and one of the worst massacres in American history. We live with so many broken promises. There's all these things that happen to tribes over time that uh, were unjust, uh, that were not right. And, and today we're saying, no, don't put this pipeline here. Enough is enough. Respect our lands. Respect our people. Respect our rights. The company is going to try to ramrod this thing through our throats as fast as they can, and they're doing it. Representatives from Energy Transfer Partners, the parent company of Dakota Access Pipeline, declined to be interviewed. But in the past, they have claimed that the pipeline is a safer alternative to truck and rail transportation of crude oil, and that it poses no significant threat to the tribe's drinking water or sacred sites. Likely in reference to a series of 2015 public hearings on the project that tribal officials did not attend, Kelsey Warren, the CEO of Energy Transfer Partners, told the Wall Street Journal, I really wish for the Standing Rock Sioux that they had engaged in discussions way before they did. We could have changed the route. It could have been done, but it's too late. There's a button on your mic. You just push it and there's a green light that should come on. But according to a newly released audio recording from the first meeting between the tribe and pipeline officials in 2014, a full year before the permitting process began, Energy Transfer Partners has known all along how the tribe felt about their project. There we go. Does that work? Good morning. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. I am Tammy Ibach with Dakota Access Pipeline, and I know that one of the representatives from, from Standing Rock has, has contacted the parent company, Energy Transfer Partners, who owns Dakota Access Pipeline, with some environmental questions already. So we're here to, to detail the project and to answer questions. And, and just before you, get, before you get started on the project, I want you to know and understand that um, we recognize our, our treaty boundaries, mm -hmm. the Fort Lamering Treaty of 1851 and 1868. Because of that, we, we oppose of a pipeline. We have a standing resolution that was passed in 2012 that opposes any uh, pipeline uh, within the treaty boundary. So just so you know, coming, coming in, uh, this is something that the tribe is not um, supporting. This is something that the tribe does not um, wish. Thank you, Chairman. From the beginning, it's known by the state PUC, it's known by the company, it's known by the Army Corps of Engineers, that we did not want this pipeline to come through here. The Standing Rock Sioux Tribe has always uh, maintained the position that we're about protecting our water. We're about protecting our, our sacred places. We're about protecting our sovereignty. We're about protecting uh, the future, uh, our, our future generations, the, the children who are not yet born. And uh, we have always opposed this pipeline not for any other reasons. Those, those are our reasons. But on July 25th, 2016, despite pleas from three different federal agencies urging them to consult further with the tribe, the Army Corps of Engineers issued the environmental assessment needed for the pipeline to cross the Missouri River, claiming they had adequately consulted with the tribe. A month later, the tribe sued the Army Corps for not properly consulting them. 11 days after that, Energy Transfer sued the tribe for blocking construction. The fight was just getting started. This is something that created a rising in indigenous people, a spirit awakening. And, and across the world, the support is overwhelming and they're, they're uh, saying enough is enough. Beginning in the spring of 2016, the first protest camps began to take shape just south of pipeline construction sites. We started out small, probably about 300 people, and after a couple of weeks it went to thousands. It seemed like everything grew so fast. 
Winona Casto established the first kitchen at the Osheti Shakoi camp. It started out with one kitchen, and as the tribes came, they created their own kitchens for their people. I know at one time there was eight, and now I don't even know how many now. Kitchens aren't the only service found in camp. There's an art supply tent, a legal services tent, a donation center, as well as 24-hour medical services. We have excellent medical services here. We have doctors, nurses, native and herbal medicines, lots of skilled personnel here. But perhaps the most important service in camp can be found at the Indigenous People's Power Project Camp. This is general orientation, right? This is the first step. These training sessions are being offered every day at 2 p.m. The orientation goes over a set of principles that we developed with the leadership of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe here. So these are a set of action principles that we came up with. Um, one, we are protectors, not protesters. We are protectors. We're doing our best to train as many people as we can uh, to make sure that they're safe and most of all effective. We just want people to go into this eyes open and know what you're getting yourself into, what some of the dynamics are. You want to think about what you're willing to put your body through, what you're willing to risk, and how you're willing to defend people uh, in a nonviolent, nonviolent way, right? Nonviolence is definitely a core aspect of the movement. When this movement was started, um, a ceremony was held, and in that ceremony, there's spiritual guidance that was given. Um, the Spirit said that as long as people are peaceful and prayerful in this fight, that we'll win. When this camp started, the spirits told us, you know, we have to, to follow behind the youth and we have to stay in prayer. And so, you know, as the youth council and, and you know, being the, you know, spiritual leader for the youth, you know, we try to keep people, you know, in that state of mind. When we're on, you know, the front lines or whatever you want to call them, we always remind people to stay in prayer. You know, if we see people getting, you know, worked up or, or you know, they, they look like they're having a hard time, you know, we talk to them, we pull them aside, just because that's kind of the role that we put, we placed ourselves in, you know, the de-escalators. But we need to get all the kids. You know, it really empowers people, you know, to, to see young people doing this. We want people to, to see us and know who we are and know that we're there to help. You know, we're the seventh generation. We're not here to, to change the world. We're here to, to ignite the flame, you know, start the, the sparks for, for the generation after us so that they'll have this strong sense of unity. They'll have this strong sense of sovereignty, you know, from a young age. And me personally, you know, I'm willing to set my life on the line to protect this water, you know, to protect this way of life, Munchi Makah, Mother Earth. And so I'm willing to do whatever it takes. You know, I hope it doesn't come down to that, but, you know, and Crazy Horse, you know, once said, you know, it's a, today's a good day to die. On September 3rd, 2016, Dakota Access Pipeline construction crews began bulldozing ground that had only a day earlier been identified by the tribe in court as containing sacred sites. In response, hundreds of people climbed the fence to confront the construction workers. Among them was Tashina Sapoin, an IIYC member. When we first got there and I seen about what looked to be about seven individuals having these dogs and holding on to them. And I looked at this dog because Shunka means dog in Lakota. And Shunka traditionally is sacred. So I leaned down and I crouched kind of like in a squat position going ha shunka ha trying to calm it down when I tried to go in to pet it the woman then tapped the side of the dog and had the dog in between her legs and the short leash on it and then the dog hesitated when it looked at me it didn't move at first and then she did it again and then it lunged for me bit me right on my right breast. You know, I kind of sat back and I didn't feel it, just like the mace, I didn't feel it. And then somebody turned to me and they said, you're bleeding, and I looked down and my whole breast was full of blood and there was whole puncture marks in my t-shirt. 
The construction crews eventually left the scene that day. Police reported that several private security officers were injured during the confrontation. Everything you've been hearing on, on social media, social media, that this is, has been peaceful and they want to do it by prayer, this is not the, the way to do this. Uh, this needs to uh, uh, come to an end. Uh, it needs to agreement that needs to come with tribal leadership and get together and put an end to this and make sure that it's done properly in the courts and uh, not done in this manner. Three, five, four, three, five. Tribal officials claimed 12 people were bitten by the security dogs. The dog handlers did not respond to ABC News' request for comment, but a subsequent investigation by the local sheriff's office found they were not properly licensed. That day I got bit by a dog it was only the beginning of their violence. Now today we're shot at with bol rubber bullets, maced on the spot with these big cans of pepper spray. Smoke canisters thrown at us when we did not when we're doing nothing but wanting them to get off the sacred land. On October 22nd, we went to stand in solidarity and pray for our brothers and sisters that had locked down on some equipment. Pretty soon, like, we were just surrounded by riot police and armored vehicles and, like, 100 officers just standing in front of you with batons and shotguns and all this, all these weapons for a peaceful people, like, you know, we were praying. Do not be afraid! Stand in prayer! <laughs> As law enforcement closed in on her group, Lauren says she began trying to convince the officers to let a small child leave the scene. I was speaking to an officer and I had noticed a um, member of the National Guard behind him. He was in military fatigues and stuff and had a face mask on and he was had a baton in his hand and um, he was like right behind him like just staring at me. I would just notice him when I was trying to talk to this officer. and. So when I grabbed the boy and I motioned for the officer to take him so he can, you know, go, I just seen that cop, like, just, sh like, he was back there and then a second later he was in front of my face with a baton telling me to get the F back. And he just, like, started, like, bashing my head. Well, it's aimed at my head and the boy was still with me and I had to push the boy back. And my friend Leah and Danny gra grabbed the boy and were trying to console him. And like the cop just came at me again, get the F back. And I had to put my hand up to protect my head. And he just like bashed it like three or four different times. And like I said, I didn't notice it at first cause of, you know, adrenaline. But as I was walking away, I just felt it really hurting. And you know, it kind of just was like, oh yeah, I got hit. Oh yeah, that happened. That's a real thing that just happened to me. Lauren says she was first rushed back to the medic tent at camp, then to a nearby reservation hospital. They said that the small, there's probably small fractures in my tiny little bones in my wrist. Because I can't, I can't bend it like this. That hurts way too much. I was like, okay. Well, they'll be healed soon. I can't really stop what I'm doing, you know. We put our bodies at risk for a good cause. October 22nd marked the first mass arrest carried out by the Morton County Sheriff's Office, which denied Lauren's story in an email to ABC News. More than 140 people were arrested, including several journalists. Lauren returned to the front lines the next day. Less than a week later, on October 27th, police forces would clear a newly established winter camp on land owned by Dakota Access Pipeline. It was known as Sacred Grounds. All of a sudden, you see these militarized vehicles, these Humvees, slowly inching towards us with men on both sides of them. There were hundreds of cops there and they were coming at us and we didn't know what to do. They started using sound cannons. They were arresting people left and right. Really, they were macing people. They were hitting people with batons. You know, witnessing all this, it's scary. 
it's not easy because my sister likes to jump in the front lines. An officer at that action tried to grab my wrist and he saw my wrist. I saw him looking at it plenty of times. He right away went for my wrist and twisted it again and was like, you're under arrest. And a couple people from behind grabbed me so I could get away. And I just wrapped it back up and went back out. I mean, it's gonna hurt anyway, either way. I could either be hurt at camp feeling sorry for myself or I could be up at the front lines hurting and helping people. Half our council members were arrested that day. We were unarmed, we were in peace, and we were in prayer. People were also getting out of hand on our part of the side, but, you know, I don't blame them. You know, this has happened for so long that it's not gonna happen right now in this generation. You know, after we were arrested, they held us on the side of the road for hours while bulldozers, you know, went over the the burial sites, you know, they were working, you know, full force behind us. And we had to sit there, you know, with restraints on and watch that happen. It was, it was a sad day. This is your last chance! The clearing of Sacred Grounds Camp would result in more than 140 arrests. Police claimed rocks and other debris were thrown at them. Due to the outbreak of several fires, nearly all of those arrested were charged with a felony count of conspiracy to endanger by fire or explosion. But those charges were later thrown out by a judge. Most of those who were arrested that day were first brought to the Morton County Law Enforcement Center for processing before being shipped out to jails all across the state. They would put you in holding cells, as they call them. All of us who got arrested referred to them as dog kennels. They were basically um, chain link fence, wire mesh cells of about 10 feet by 12 to 14 feet long. And I know that the Sheriff's Department has come out and said that these holding cells, as they call them, were approved by the Department of Corrections. The dog kennels, again, as we refer them to, were in their parking garage for the, for the um, county jail. And so here you have guys with just their pants on cold concrete floor in a parking garage inside dog kennels with the ambient air temperature being around 40, 45 degrees. Um, they call that approved by the Department of Corrections. Well, we call it inhumane. Like everyone else arrested that day, a number was written on Ron's arm for identification purposes. And so the idea that that's the only way they could recognize you was by your number, we find that very offensive to be right. Keep us, keeping us in, in inhumane dog kennels and writing numbers on us, that's, that's, that's not how people get treated in America, or not supposed to get treated in America. Morton County Sheriff Kyle Kirchmeyer told ABC News in a brief interview that the protest activities at Standing Rock have put a tremendous amount of strain on his officers. Well, as we go through this, and you know, this has started back since uh, August 10th, and uh, so it's been on a, it's going on for uh, a time now and it definitely is very uh, uh, taxing and straining as we continue to uh, to find a very peaceful resolution to uh, uh, you know to the to the protest and to the activity so uh, you know you just got to take it and I take it uh, day to day uh, you go to work uh, you see what happens and you you go from there but uh, the number one thing here is maintaining the, the public safety and that goal is not going to change. The sheriff has long claimed that the protests are not peaceful and that his officers have behaved professionally in an extremely difficult situation. Law enforcement isn't the aggressor here and we are not the attackers. The only time that law enforcement is responding uh, to these situations is when uh, the aggression is taken out against law enforcement and we have the right and the lawful duty uh, to make sure that uh, the peace is maintained and that's what we're doing. When we are confronted with hatred, it is so tempting to get revenge. We don't want to become the very thing that is hurting us. Confront hatred with love. Any drums? In the aftermath of the confrontations at the Sacred Grounds Camp, the International Indigenous Youth Council feared the movement might lose its grounding in peaceful ceremony. 
So along with other groups at camp, they helped organize an action they hoped would restore a sense of harmony. They called it the Forgiveness March. That Forgiveness March was really powerful. I loved how it happened because we didn't violate any traffic laws. I remember walking through this, the tunnel, the tunnel that went across the bridge, and I remember looking back and just being like, oh, oh my gosh. Like, look at how many people are here, and they were all tunneling through this little, this little path. They were all there to pray, and they were all there to forgive, and everyone was doing it in their own way, you know? And it was just like, oh my gosh. I felt really, I felt really, really good about that day. This is a great opportunity for us really to connect with the police officers on a human to human level. I don't think the police officers are horrible people. The people that are here, like we're not, we're not fighting against the police or the sheriff's department, you know? Like we're here to stop a pipeline and we're here to protect water. I hope it touches some of their hearts. You say, open up and On October 27th, a great many of our friends and family were very severely hurt. At this time, we must also say that we are not perfect people either. That we did things and we said things on the, that day that were not in alignment with the spirit of Wawunshila, humility. And so, Wawaki Tonje from what my own she told me, does not only mean I forgive you, it also means I'm asking you to forgive me. And so we stand here today acknowledging that both sides stepped out of their center that day. Back at camp the next day, the IIYC led another action aimed at bringing the movement back to its center. We wanted to do, you know, just a prayer march, just to, to keep, you know, remind people why we're here. So we did a silent march. It wasn't to, you know, silence ourselves, because, you know, we've, we've already been silenced for so long over the past few centuries. But it was more to show discipline, you know, and humility. It was kind of hard to believe that, you know, there was 400 people walking behind me because you couldn't hear a thing. When the marchers reached the barricade at the Backwater Bridge, Terrell and other IIYC members had the rest of the group wait while they approached the police line. Hello, relatives. My name is Terrell. We're, we're here with the International Indigenous Youth Council. And we walked to the bridge, and you know, we prayed with the police there. We, we offered them water that, that we prayed with and we were using in our ceremony. You know, there was five of them, only one of them you know, accepted our offer. One of them prayed with us. We would like to thank him. <laughs> it showed not only us that the officers are also humans, but it also showed, you know, a lot of humility and courage on the officers' part, knowing that, you know, by taking that water and by praying with us, he knew that the other officers there would, you know, would treat him differently. It's something that I'll never forget just because of how together we were and how, you know, unified we were.
The arrival of winter did little to persuade people to leave camp. Wood and propane continued to pour in as tents gave way to hard structures. But on the night of November 20th, the movement would get its first taste of what the winter meant for direct action on the high plains. Next tonight here to the new flashpoint in the pipeline showdown in North Dakota. Hundreds of protesters clashing with police in riot gear, trying to block the pipeline's construction. After several demonstrators tried to remove burnt out vehicles from the backwater bridge, they were joined by hundreds of others who lined up in front of the police barricade. And they were spraying them with like two high pressure hoses. They would try to get someone to go down, and they, once they would go down, they would just direct the spray cannons right at them. By then, they were already shooting tear gas at us. They were already using the water hose. They were shooting everybody with rubber bullets and sandbags. All that tear gas, um, my chest hurt for like maybe a week. It was pretty traumatizing, you know. I, got, I had to see all that, and uh, it was hard to see it, and it's even hard to talk about it right now. Police described the night of November 20th as a riot. You all right? Well, they just shot him for speaking. They shot him. The Standing Rock Medic and Healing Council reported over 300 injuries that evening, with 26 having to be taken to the hospital. Three days later, on November 25th, the Army Corps issued what amounted to an eviction notice. By December 5th, their lands would no longer be open to the public, meaning everyone at the Osheti Shikoi camp had to leave. The announcement was quickly followed by an evacuation order issued by the governor, and the Morton County Sheriff's Department warned that anyone carrying supplies to camp would be subject to a $1,000 fine. So what we were thinking is like telling people who are already extremely paranoid that if you're really paranoid about it on the 5th, we'll have army tents over there set up. And if you're really paranoid about you and your kids, we'll have those ready for you so you can go ahead and sleep in there until that time passes. Like I said, we're not really sure what they are going to do, if they're even going to come raid. How do you feel about it, Alex? I mean um, I feel scared. You know, this is my life for the past three months, and I've grown so connected to these people and the land, and I'm scared for it. I'm scared about people getting hurt. You know, someone dying, and it's scary. For the IAYC, the winter was off to a bad start. But then, an opportunity arose. The Sheriff's Department had put out a list of donations uh, that the police officers were asking for, um, specifically the police officers who have been uh, next to the barricade and up here. And so the Youth Council has decided that we're going to take them those donations. We're saying, hey, you know, like, you might try and cut off the supplies that we're given, and, but regardless of what you do, we're still here in prayer and we're still going to be, you know, giving our heart and our souls to those who are in need. And if you guys need stuff, like, here it is. Wait, wait. They know me. <laughs> it's her, the one you broke your Love you guys. We give this to you. We're going to leave it right here because you won't open the door. I promise mean, it's safe. It we didn't do anything bombs. to it. Hello. Please, just leave the cameras outside, though. The Youth Council has always been and will always continue to be about prayer and peace. You know, no matter how violent they get, you know, like, we're, we don't hate them. The cops aren't our enemies, you know. The pipeline workers aren't our enemy. They're just doing their job, you know. We pray for everybody and we want, to, want it to remain prayerful and peaceful.
because that's, you know, that's how we're going to win. We're not going to win being violent back to them. development in the long-running standoff over the Dakota Access Pipeline. A major victory for the Sioux Tribe at Standing Rock. The Army Corps of Engineers halted construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. On December 4, 2016, the Army announced it would not approve the easement needed for the pipeline to cross the Missouri River pledging to consider alternative routes in a full environmental impact statement. It feels really good. Right now, it feels all worth it. The pain's gone. I'm so happy right now. Like, you don't understand how much pain I went through it. It feels so good to have a win. It's an indigenous person. Sometimes growing up, you feel like nobody sees you. You feel like people don't want you around. And you feel like if you just disappeared, everybody would just be happy. And it feels good to be acknowledged as a human being. This is just a small victory, but what we're saying is that if you think that you're gonna endanger the, the lives of any human being, indigenous or not, you have to go through us first. We protect this earth, and you will have a very difficult time doing this. Our people have been fighting for so long, you know, for our rights as indigenous people, for our, you know, our land rights, our water rights. And I'm, I'm really proud to, to be living, you know, be here at this time. You know, this is history. It's done. Their purpose has been um, served by them uh, staying there. It only uh, jeopardizes uh, people's lives and it puts people in harm's way. In the wake of the Army's announcement, Dave Archambault, the chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux, pleaded for people to leave the camps as a brutal winter storm approached. But many at camp, including the IYC, have vowed to continue the fight. I know that in a way, it seems like this is over. This is far from over. I believe that we have had a major win, but that we still have a lot of work to do to ensure that it stops. As far as Donald Trump goes and other pipelines though, that's where our, our problem begins to hit because all indigenous people all indigenous resources are going to be at risk. This day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. Prior to his election, Donald Trump's presidential campaign received more than $100,000 from Kelsey Warren, the CEO of Energy Transfer Partners. Trump also held significant investments in the companies involved with the construction and operation of the Dakota Access Pipeline. And although Trump claimed to have since purged himself of such investments, he has offered no substantial proof of that claim. And in the meantime, he has selected Rick Perry, who has sat on the Energy Transfer Partners board, to head the Department of Energy. This is with respect to the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Dakota Access Pipeline. Again, subject to terms and conditions to be negotiated by us. Less than a week after taking office, Trump signed a memorandum ordering the Army Corps of Engineers to review and approve the pipeline in an expedited manner. I just want people to remember not to turn a blind eye after this. This isn't today's hot news. This isn't a trending topic. My biggest fear is that people will just see this as a Woodstock. 
see this as, as, a, as a festival or a show and as soon as it's over they're just gonna go back to their ignorant lives and pretend like everything's all right now. We got our pictures with the Indians, now we can go back home. The past couple of months have been a painfully beautiful experience. What goes through my head is, is how much we as a people have grown, how much we as a people have regained our power, have regained our voice, how much we as a people now have the power to influence other tribal people and begin to bring back that hope, bring back that pride. We are a people that has a voice and can use that voice to make change 